Fair enough. Thanks, Dan. And I did want to just thank you all for uh, inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I, what I've tried to do is take what sh would probably normally be a little bit longer and, and squeeze it into an hour of an overview. And I want to just tell you a little tiny bit about me so you have some idea where I'm coming from. I was originally actually trained as a, as a, a research psychologist at Harvard um, back in the 70s, but I very quickly got into ap applying what uh, I had learned in instructional design applications in the early 70s, early 80s, and then got into performance improvement, um, largely through the International Society of Performance Improvement, some of the thought leaders there uh, in the 80s and 90s, and I had a company in Boston for some years called Product Knowledge Systems where we focused on sales enablement. And then about 10 years ago, we decided to start teaching people the methodology and the framework that we have. So that's kind of what I do now. That's the real quick background. Um, what I want to do is give you a little bit of an overview of what we call performance thinking or six boxes performance thinking, which is kind of the model and the approach that we bring to the table. I want to talk a little bit about employee engagement as it relates to our model and then how leaders and managers, uh, as we are beginning to see, can make a big impact on talent development. And of course, the current buzzword or, or you know, theme or whatever you want to call it of agile talent development that's out there, I think is quite relevant. So let's, uh, let me move fairly quickly with this and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end. I, I always want to start with this statement and can everybody, by the way, yeah, I think you can see my screen. I wanted to be sure I was sharing my screen. Yes, I, I can see. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, you know, I always like to start with a statement that our purpose is to accelerate business results through the performance of people. And I think this is true for both leaders and managers as well as for us performance professionals. And the reason I like to start out with this is a lot of times we get so embedded in our programs and our tools and our methods for example, I've, I work with countless learning and development groups where we're, where we're basically enabling them to become performance consultants. And when I ask them what their contributions or work outputs or accomplishments are, they'll often tell me about their programs and materials and job aids, which is all great. But what I always want to remind them is, is sort of the CEO is not going to really care too much until, unless we have people who can do and produce things that contribute to business results. So this is kind of like the, you know, the starting place. Um, now in this work, and I don't want to sort of bore you with the academic background very much, but I want to give you a little bit about where this came from. These three men had an enormous impact on the work that we do. Uh, they all happen to be mentors of mine. I had the good fortune. Some people in those days might have thought it was studying with the devil, but I, I had the good fortune of uh, being in the doctoral program with Dr. Skinner back in the 70s. And he basically taught me, among other things, that if you take, if you apply natural science if, uh, to our own behavior, you can make a difference. And there's a lot more to it than that, but that sort of set me off in a career of trying to bring behavior science into as many different environments with as little nerdiness as possible. Um, Tom Gilbert, was, whose name you might recognize, it was a big thought leader in the performance improvement world. He wrote a kind of famous book called Human Competence back in the late 70s. And as you'll see, um, he kind of brought, he really brought behavior science into what he called the world of work. And the models that we use are very closely connected to Tom's work, as I'll explain. And then Joe Harless, who was actually a protege of Dr. Gilbert's, um, he really turned this methodology of being accomplishment-based, which is what I'm going to talk about, into a really full-blown approach that could be adopted by companies like Boeing and others. Now, his approach was very detailed and very job-aided down to the last nit. And so it was very powerful and replicable, and I learned a lot from Joe. But what I also learned was that when you make things too sort of geeky, they're great for us performance improvement nerds, but they aren't necessarily so great for regular folks with whom we work. So these guys had a big impact. And then there's another person, and you're probably going to think this is kind of a, you know, schlocky thing, but it's really true. Uh, Steve, Steve Jobs had a big impact on me. I, one of my mentors turned me on to him in Apple Computer back in the 70s. And what I got from that, among other things, was the importance of simplicity. And in fact, there's this great book that you might find interesting called, um, I think it's called Insanely Simple, 
uh, that's about Steve Jobs. And there's a quotation in it that, I, you know, you're not supposed to read these long quotations, but I'm gonna do it anyway, um, because I think it kind of summarizes what we've been trying to do for about 30 years. And what Steve said was, when you start looking at a problem and it seems really simple with all these simple solutions, you don't really understand the complexity of the problem. And in a certain way, that's how we sometimes bring some of the principles of behavior science, for example, in performance management to the table. But he says, your solutions are way too simplified and they don't work. Um, and then you get into the problem and you see it's really complicated and you come up with all these convoluted solutions. And that's sort of the middle. And it's where most people stop and the solutions tend to work for a while. And I would say that's the field of performance improvement or HPI or human performance technology, whatever phrases you use with all the complicated models that exist. But you can keep on going and find the key underlying principle of the problem and come up with a beautiful, elegant solution that works. Now, I'm definitely no Steve Jobs, but uh, I've tried to kind of follow this rationale, as you'll see. And so, you know, one way to think about this is if you look out there in the field of performance improvement, which is sort of where I've been in living over the years, uh, and I'm going to turn off the sound here. Can you still hear me, by the way? Is, yep. Because uh, I don't, I don't want the sound from my computer to uh, bother you because I have a bunch of sounds here. But when you um, when you look at all the models that have been developed for the analysis and improvement of performance, they're pretty complicated. And this is just a set of them from one publication a few years ago. And they're all good. They were all developed by thought leaders. There, you know, there's the Venn diagram one, and there's the ones that look like flow charts and org <laughs> charts and cubes and all the rest of it. Uh, and then this is the big one. I refer to this as the uh, everything, including the kitchen sink model. Um, <laughs> it's the one that the International Society for Performance Improvement has had on its website for years. And it's all good. You know, you look at it and you say, yeah, that's all important stuff when we're trying to improve performance or develop performance, but it's way complicated. And I, you know, typical response by leaders and executives often is, Oh, this looks like an awful lot. How long is this going to take? Is this analysis paralysis and all that? So what I sort of set out to do about 10, 10 or 12 years ago, and really it was based on work that we've been doing a lot longer than that is to, um, put forth a, an approach that would involve analyzing and communicating about human performance in ways that are actionable and evidence-based, which is kind of what all these methodologies are about. But what we set out to do is to use simple visual models in plain language so that it could be shared. So that basically, uh, you know, we, anybody at any level and at any function could apply these principles, these models, this logic, uh, to collaborate, to form communities of practice, to continuously improve performance. And uh, we adopted a phrase actually from our clients called performance thinking. We had clients probably eight, 10 years ago who were saying, you know, you guys are giving us some tools and all that, but basically you're, you're coming up with, you're teaching us how to think differently about performance. So that was kind of the idea that we brought forth. And what I'd like to do uh, fairly quickly is to give you an overview of how we think about this because these are the underlying kind of issues that we think need to be addressed and then I want to show you how leaders and managers can engage with this. So it, whether you're a leader, manager, you know, training and development person, performance improvement person of any kind, you got to have crisp, clear answers to these three questions, it seems to me. Um, one of them is how do we define human performance? What is it? And if we were in a room with flip charts and we had a little more time, I would ask you, you know, that question and, um, and people would come up typically with lots of answers. You know, it's about people contributing to business results. It's about people behaving in ways that make a difference. It's about people producing contributions. There'd be a whole lot of language about it. And usually the language is all pretty good, but it varies a lot. And so what I would argue is that we need a coherent, straightforward, agreed upon definition. And as you'll see, we have that, what we think the elements of human performance are. And then the second one is, what influences it? What are all the variables? You know, well, how do we, what are the levers for improving performance? And, you know, we all have our favorite lists and our executives and managers often have the training box as the assumption, you know, got a performance problem, train them. Uh, but whatever it is, we need some, again, 
framework that allows us to understand what we can do to influence uh, performance. And then the third one is, if you got answers to those two questions, what do we do? You know, is there a methodology here? Is there a process? So let me take those one at a time. If we ask the question, what is human performance? This is where Tom Gilbert had an enormous impact. And this is back, he was, he came out of the instructional design and also behavior science world. And so this word here, cult of behavior, was kind of a poke in the eye in that he said in the great cult of behavior, behavior itself is viewed as an end rather than as a means to an end. We must enable people to produce what he called accomplishments, the valuable products of behavior. Now this was for me and for an awful lot of people, a uh, world changing paradigm because if you think about it as managers, leaders, trainers, almost anybody, ordinary folks, we tend to look at, talk about, investigate, et cetera, our own activity, our behavior. But what he pointed out is that in organizations at least, and I would even say in personal life, what's really important is the things that that behavior produces. So this is a big change. And he talked about accomplishments. Um, one of the things you'll see that's common in the work that, that I'll, I'm showing you is language that people understand uh, immediately. And some years ago, we decided to use the phrase work outputs instead of accomplishments. Because if you look up accomplishments, an awful lot of the meanings of accomplishments mean the completion of some activity. And what I want to know is what those activities produce. And so we call them work outputs, and you'll see that on the subsequent slides. Um, so our answer to the question about what is performance is that there are three elements. It's behavior, producing work outputs that contribute to business results. And, you know, I like to show sh uh, uh, um, uh, athletic or sports examples because people can relate to them and I particularly like soccer because our clients in you know the UK and Italy and Dubai get it and if I showed them baseball or football they wouldn't get it so here's this young lady and she's behaving if it were animated you see she's behaving she's kicking the ball and so that's the behavior and the question is what are the work outputs or accomplishments well it's ideally it's a goal or it's a ball in the net uh, or maybe it's a ball in the other in the teammates, you know, foot that can be sent to the net. But basically, the work output is a ball in the net. It's a goal. And then, wh why do we care? Well, the business results, if you will, and literally in something like the World Cup, or when they're not so much the World Cup, but if you look at the professional soccer organizations, it's winning the game. It's the score. It's you know that's what the business results are, at least metaphorically. And so we teach people these three elements of performance and distinguish between them. We want to point out that behavior is actions, it's verbs, you know, and, and work outputs are things. They're countable things, whether those things are tangible, like reports or widgets or analyses, or intangible, like decisions or uh, relationships. They're things that are valuable, and they're valuable because they contribute to, in some way, to overall business results. So we have a model, our first of two models, which is called the performance chain. And it basically reflects what I just said. It reflects how behavior produces business results. And so when we use this model, we, we engage people in starting with the end in mind. Uh, that is what at the whole organization level are we concerned about here? And this list you'll see of you know, product sales, revenues, profits, employee engagement, et cetera. Those are just examples but those are things which are considered to be indicators of a whole organization or whole company's success. And they're typically measured and the executives or investors or major stockholders will be concerned about them. And that's what we're trying to affect. And we want to actually have our employees get what the connection is between what they do day to day and those, those results. And going back from there, that's where work outputs come in. And it's usually missed. This is not usually something that people are clear about, but, you'll see that list below work outputs, uh, deliverables, transactions, and so forth. Um, that list is not so much a taxonomy or, or categorization as it is um, based on a, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we realized when we started teaching people the difference between work outputs and behavior, that they had kind of a narrow idea of what work outputs are. So they tend to think of deliverables. And there's a lot of other kinds, transactions, for example, like a sale. You know, whether or not somebody puts a receipt in your hand, the completion of that sale or transaction is, is, a, is a work output or decision. 
um, or milestones in a process like a sales process or a manufacturing process or a financial you know, decision making or budgeting process. And so these are all important kinds of work outputs and they're really what we want to focus on. And as you'll see, we anchor our analysis and we, we, we encourage leaders and managers to do the same. Once you got clarity on that, whether you're an instructional designer or a manager or a leader, now you're in a much stronger position to say, okay, what's the activity? What, what's the actual behavior needed to produce those? And we can do task analyses. We can, you know, we can, all kinds of stuff. Uh, one of the more important things we can do is if the performance already exists, we can go uh, interview and observe exemplary performers, people who produce these work outputs at exceptionally high levels. And then we can identify what behavior really makes a difference. So those are the three elements of performance, as I described earlier. And then there's a fourth part to this chain, which is all the stuff we do to try to affect the performance. And we call them behavior influences. And as I'm sure you're very aware, depending on what book or magazine or program you've been to lately, that list can get very, very long. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so this is the first model. It's the performance chain. You know, it works from left to right. People get that rather quickly. And we analyze it uh, from right to left. And, uh, and so it's essential to understanding performance in a crisp way that everybody can agree on. And you might notice under work outputs there, it says criteria for good. One of the things we help people to define and get good at is defining what is, what's considered a good one of these work outputs, whether it's a you know, document or a widget or a decision or a relationship. So where do we find them? Because that turns out to be the thing. The world doesn't present you lists of things to discriminate. You got to find work outputs. And for most leaders and managers, as well as performance professionals, there's two typical places. One is in a business process. And business processes are typically mapped and described as a series of activities or behavior listed in those boxes. That's a classic way to, to, to you know, document a process. But what we really care about is the work outputs. That is the things that each of those activities produce. And one of the areas that we've seen we can add, and a lot of our six boxes practitioners add to the process improvement world, is that we ask that we can get really crisp and clear about what the thing is that each of those activities produces. It might just be a revised version of the previous thing or an approved version, as you can see, but uh, that turns out to be really critical. And so a lot of the work we do, both as performance professionals and also as leaders or managers, is looking at our processes, understanding how the value is delivered in them, and focusing on those things to optimize them. But the other place, and this is going to be most relevant, I think, in the leader-manager discussion, is we have this tool we call the customer diagram. And we teach it in our coaching and management programs. We teach it also in our practitioner programs. The performer, in this case, the sales director, is in the middle. The performer's customers, if you will, or the people to whom the sales director, in this case, delivers value, are around the outside. And the circled things are the work outputs. Now, it turns out uh, this is something you can teach people to do, and it turns out that it's a very powerful way to define performance. And in fact, if you have a discussion between, let's say, a manager and his or her direct report, uh, there's a lot of clarity that just comes out of this discussion alone. And, uh, you know, it can get messy. We do it on big pieces of paper, whiteboards. But once you get really clear on it, it's enormously clarifying. And by the way, there's a lot fewer outputs than there are kinds of behavior. So it helps focus and, and make things lean. Now, one of the things that Gilbert said years ago was that if you're looking at trying to build interventions, whether you're a you know, leader manager trying to recommend that somebody go do something as a development activity, or whether you're a training and development person, the worth of the intervention ought to be thought of as the, equal to the value of the accomplishments that it enables people to produce or improve divided by the cost of behavior, because behavior is just costly. Now, in current day terms, that's ROI. So we don't push the quantitative analysis of this kind of thing but we push it as a way of thinking about how can we optimize the return on any effort we have uh, to improve performance. We wanna be sure that we, you know, for example, a job aid often is a lot less expensive 
than taking people off the job for half a, more, half a day. And so if we can increase the accomplishments with maybe spending a little bit of time, uh, you know, introducing the job aid, we can get a much bigger ROI. So that's the basic argument about what is performance. The second question then is what influences it? And this really started out, I'm gonna give you a little bit of geeky science right now, but this started out at least in my lineage with Skinner's science. In, in Skinner's laboratory environment, and in the work that has actually been done by people like Aubrey Daniels and other pretty important performance management people in the meantime, there is this slightly nerdy equation here, which is a discriminative stimulus, or what some people call antecedent, sets the occasion for a response, which ideally is followed by a reinforcing stimulus. Now, you can't get much nerdier than an equation like this. When Gilbert looked at this, he said, but wait a minute, humans in the world of work are different than experimental subjects in the laboratory where we're sure, for example, if they're pigeons, we're sure they're hungry. So we know food will be an effective consequence. We know how to build an environment so they can respond easily and all that. What is he said? We people are different than that. And so his model. Oh, how it's growing. Hello? Oops. We okay? Everybody there? Yeah, we're here. Okay, good. All right. Just, I, just heard, I just heard some sound. I wanted to be sure that wasn't. So, no, what, that was me. I, I dropped off because my computer died. So I'm. No problem. Uh, okay, so, so what Gilbert said was look, there's two levels of this thing for humans. On the top, in the environment, there's what he called data, which gives us information about what we're supposed to do, how we're doing, that sort of thing. There are what he called instruments, which, which are basically all the things in the physical and social environment that enable us to perform, like software and process design and having enough time and ventilation and having team we can turn to, and he called that instruments. And incentives, which is essentially what happens you know, when you do the thing, whatever it is, the behavior, what are the consequences, positive or negative? And then the individual, unlike in the laboratory experiment, carries around uh, information in the form of knowledge or skills and knowledge and has capacity in the sense of has characteristics by which we assign, you know, select and assign people. So you're analytical enough to be an accountant, you know, you're friendly and sociable enough to be the person that we connect up with the other department, et cetera, et cetera. We hire people based on those kind of characteristics. And then motives was Tom's way of saying, we can arrange incentives, but if we don't understand what people care about, they may not work. So this was his model. And I encountered it in the early 80s when I was basically working down in the knowledge domain. I was helping in those days to turn uh, loan officers and banks into uh, salespeople. And so we were doing a lot of training. But what we realized was that if we didn't arrange the things in those other cells on the job to set expectations, to provide the tools necessary, to reward doing the new thing, our training wasn't gonna pay off much. And so we got very excited about this model and I and my colleagues, the teams of people that I was managing and leading, used it. But what we found was when we, um, when we went to speak to our colleagues and our clients, they were like, well, what's that again? What do you mean by instruments? You know, data, what is that again? Is that spreadsheets or, you know, what are we talking about here? So in about 1983 or so, I started tweaking the language. And over about two or three years, I tried different stuff. And by the late uh, 80s, I came up with this language and I knew I had it right because I could literally, I, I mean, I even remember examples of, of speaking with somebody for 10 or 15 minutes. They just would ask me some about some problem as I was on my way out of a consulting engagement or something. And, and I would maybe spend 10 or 15 minutes and I would just kind of overview this model, talk them through it, maybe put it on the back of an envelope or a napkin or something. And then one occasion I remember, I can see it still. I came back a few weeks later and the person had the napkin uh, uh, pinned to their, uh, to their cubicle wall. And they said, I've been using that. And they told me a fairly, it wasn't that they were sophisticated performance consultants, but they told me some things that said, oh yeah, they get it quickly. So we glommed onto that language. And I still didn't really know what to call it, but then a few years later in about, I don't know, 91, uh, one of my clients, who was the vice president of sales at the time at Dun & Bradstreet, said, well, you're always talking about those boxes. Why don't you just call it the six boxes? So that's what we did, and eventually we trademarked it, and it's our trademarked and copyrighted model. So that's the second piece. And, and 
to be frank, in my 40 plus years of being both a behavior scientist and a out in the world practitioner, I have never found anything that influences performance that wasn't either in one of those cells or in relationships between those cells. And we can spend a lot of time on that, but that's the bottom line. It's a really effective framework for understanding what affects performance. And so then the third thing is we got these two models. So what? So now what do we do? Well, notice you can put these two models together. That is, the six boxes model makes sense out of behavior influences. It turns it from a long list into essentially a systemic framework that people say gives me a place to put things that I already know about. The logic of it is that we teach people, no matter what their role is, first to be sure they know what's at stake for the business. And then whatever the performance is that they're engaged with or looking at or trying to solve or address, what are the work outputs and how do they contribute to the business results? Are we sure we got the right stuff here, basically? If it's a manager or leader, it might be, what's the most important work outputs for my business right now? If it's a practitioner doing training or performance improvement, it might be, what are the really important outputs that we want our trainees to be able to produce at the end of the training so that it will contribute to business results? Once we're clear on that, then we do an analysis of behavior. But now it's about the behavior needed to produce those work outputs at high levels. Once we have that clear, we can measure. Because if you think about it, these are the things we can measure. We can measure business results, we can measure work outputs that meet criteria, and we can measure behavior. And there's a whole conversation about evaluation and measurement we could have here, which we don't have time for. Although there is a, there is a, a chapter uh, on our website that you could download about it. But this is a really useful framework for thinking about measurement. Once you got that in place, then we look at the behavior influences and we take a look at what's working in each of the cells, if it's existing performance, and particularly if like we're managing or coaching people that work for us. And then we brainstorm, how could we improve? What are the different things we could do in those cells that might make a difference? And then we come up with, we choose behavior influences. And again, with managers or leaders, it's a dialogue. It's a collaborative approach. And then we implement and measure and we tweak it because always there's opportunity for improvement. And then we list as, as number seven, but it's really not seven because it's kind of intermingled with all of that. If you look at these, this picture, you'll see that other than the little subtitles and parentheses, there's basically 21 words in two pictures. And so we share this language as we go, not in some formal didactic way usually, but in a way that usually is almost viral. And so what happens is this vocabulary starts to become shared vocabulary. And one of the things I love is if like is if a performance consulting kind of engagement, if you, I, you know, we might do a big complicated in some ways performance analysis and then present a findings and recommendations report where the categories are things like expectations and feedback, tools and resources, consequences and incentives. And our, and our clients don't say, what's that jargon? It just makes perfect sense to them. So, that's the logic. Now, I, I show this, I'm sort of, I love this phrase, Gina Rester Zadro, Amgen is one of our longest term biggest clients. Uh, we've been working with them for almost 10 years. They have about 200 certified six boxes practitioners who are performance consultants around the world. And every year at our annual Six Boxes Summer Institute, Gina, who is currently sort of heading up that community practice, gives a presentation and this year it was a mind blowing one because she's talking about how you grow and develop a global community of practice. And she must have said six times or five in her presentation, it just works. The thing about this is you don't have to persuade people, you just have to learn how to do it and it just works. So for performance consultants, there's no question that the methodology and tools that we teach people make a big impact. But for years, up until a few years ago, we, we said, wait a minute, there's a lot more leaders and managers than there are we performance consultants. And how can we enable them to do this? How can we enable them to make a difference? And so for about six or seven years now, we've developed and now really have a really good sort of set of programs for coaches, managers, and leaders. And I wanna tell you a little bit about that uh, just to sort of give you the rationale. But I think employee engagement is a good place to start because I don't know if you're familiar with the Gallup stuff, but the Gallup 12 is one of the most widely used uh, frameworks for assessing employee engagement. And a lot of companies have been using it for quite a long time. 
And, you know, executives are usually looking at it and they're concerned about it because one of the things we know is that there's direct relationship between levels of engagement as reflected on the Gallup 12 survey and actual business results. You know, as it says here, the, the top quartile in the, in the Gallup results have these kinds of results, you know, literally improved productivity and customer satisfaction, literally reduced these other things that it shows. So it's a big deal. And one of the things that's very clear is probably one's immediate manager or leader has the biggest impact on engagement. And so um, this is the Gallup 12, and you may have seen it before. It's often called the Gallup 12. This is a, comprises the items on their survey. And it's one of those things where people rate it from, you know, they rate it from not at all to a whole bunch, basically a series of ratings. And then they summarize this data. And it's a, it's a pretty efficient uh, list. Uh, and what I was talking about this before I really, I was talking about engagement for years before I looked carefully at this. But one of the things we recognized about six years ago was if you take those items they sort with remarkable simplicity into the six boxes model. And that kind of summarizes a lot of what we already know because, because basically what we've always proposed is that the very same influences that, that, that impact performance also affect employee engagement. So if the six boxes are all coordinated and aligned and they're positive, so that, for example, the consequences are not you know, if you don't get this done, there's a bad thing that will happen if it's positive. What we know is that that will optimize performance as well as engagement. And we think managers have the biggest potential impact on that, particularly if they're advocates for their people, you know, sort of managing up and asking the organization for what's needed. So uh, here, for example, is a six boxes model or framework or whatever you want to call it with what we've identified as best practices for leaders and managers. And if you look in there, uh, if you just take a moment and scan it, there's nothing remarkable here. Uh, it simply assembles in a coherent framework um, uh, all the things or many of the things that we know can make a big difference. And so, for example, when we're assessing leaders and managers' performance, we will often use this and find opportunities to improve these things. Um, Another way to think about this is this rather strange uh, graphic, perhaps. But we were talking about work outputs a while ago. And uh, what we've come to conclude is that among the most important work outputs of leaders or managers are behavior influences for their people. And so all those verbs along the right there, planning, inspiring, managing, coaching, those are all activities that we think of, perhaps, that leaders and managers do. But what they really amount to is arranging conditions in the six boxes model to, to optimize performance and engagement uh, of people. So uh, we bring to the table a program which teaches managers to do that. And our, varia our various programs, uh, coach manager lead programs, start with the customer diagram. So this is an example of a dialogue uh, with Mary Hansen and her manager where they identified the departments or the recipients of her work, of her work outputs and then they start to list her work outputs. And when a manager and a leader have this conversation, it doesn't take too long. There begins to be a kind of clarity and alignment about expectations here that are remarkable. And some of the, our clients in their onboarding programs have even encouraged new employees to go out and talk to their customers, like in this case, VP of retail or senior HR business partners, and ask, what do you really expect from me? So we can get clarity on these outputs. So we start with defining the outputs, and then we give people tools where they can begin to frame plans to improve or develop outputs or perhaps add work outputs for the next level. And here's a simple example of uh, somebody working on a sales proposal. And the business results that they talk about that are at stake here are revenue, customer satisfaction, and market share. And the criteria for a good sales proposal are it's by agreed upon date, it follows the guidelines and template in the proposal guide, and it's priced profitably. And then there's a fairly high level description of the behavior. And then basically the rest of this thing is the is six boxes. Uh, um, stuff that can be put in place that we need to talk about to optimize that performance. And this is a simple example of a development plan for a particular work output. 
Um, we also have some clients who have begun to add work outputs to job descriptions. So for example, one of our clients, Insperity, which is a HR outsourcing company for medium sized and small companies. This is, uh, these are the major outputs for their payroll specialist. And you can see there's a payroll response to requests, et cetera, and there's some criteria. Here's a client from Dubai, uh, the Alpha Time Group, which has about 75,000 employees and about 100 businesses. And actually, this was in a, a, a practitioner program. In our practitioner program, we actually go through the program, and then I help people select the project, and they do a project. In this case, as Tracy, it was Tracy Morgan, did an analysis of their second-level manager in their organization. And you can see, you probably can't read it, but on the right is a customer diagram for that level of manager or leader, really. And then on the left, it turns out, are a list of outputs that any leader across a number of their businesses have to be able to produce with crisply defined criteria and measures. So some of our clients have started to actually build work outputs into their job descriptions. But even if you just do it one manager or leader at a time, it turns out to be very powerful. Now, uh, you may have seen this article. Um, Dan mentioned that I spoke at the ATD regional conference a few months ago. And coincidentally, on the way home, I picked up the latest, at that time, latest copy of Harvard Business Review. And some of you may have seen this. It's a whole thing about agile talent development and agile HR, which, of course, is a really big deal these days. And, you know, the argument about it is, at the pace of business change these days, we don't have time for annual reviews and quarterly you know, reviews and sort of the usual time-based, rather sluggish approach to talent development. We need, and this is what the Harvard Business Review article points out, we need leaders and managers to drive it, usually through coaching. And even some of the things that some of our talent development folks and training and development people talk about, 70-20-30, or 70-20-10, you know, the, the notion that most of the, uh, most of the learning that people develop happens on the job or with support on the job, and only a little bit of it happens in, in the formal training. We can use the six boxes model to sort of make that happen if, if there's a dialogue between leaders and managers and their people. And so uh, this, for example, is another one I love to quote. She just said this at our last summer institute, B.J. Vaughn was a CLO at a company called Minis, uh, well, it was not Administaff, um, Amerigroup. And then she became Senior Vice President of Talent and, and um, Chief, Chief Culture Officer at Change Healthcare, which is a um, software company in the healthcare business. I did an interview with her, and she said at the end, said, Carl didn't pay me to say this, but she said, I asked her, if, you, if you're speaking to your colleagues and your peers, C-level executives, what do you tell them about this stuff? Is it even worth thinking about? And she said, this is what she said. She said, I tell C-level executives that they want to align the performance of their people with business results. Performance thinking is a business imperative, which blew my mind. But it tells you from a sort of a senior executive role how, how this is viewed. Um, this is the vision we sort of have uh, for how this can work. And some of our clients have begun to take it on. And the idea is, if you look at this process, starting with recruitment to onboarding and then, you know, specific training for jobs uh, and then the coaching kind of talent development cycle, every single one of these stages in this process can be served by a description of a job which is based on accomplishments or work outputs. So we can, we can create excellent behavioral interviews with new, potential new hires if we know what the work outputs are required of the job. We can onboard people for that subset of outputs that they really need to be able to produce day one. We can produce technical training, which is not just about skills or competencies, but it's actually built on the work outputs needed for this job. And then we can move people into a cycle where they're speaking with their leaders and managers on a regular basis, and they start by defining the work outputs that are important. And then on a frequent ongoing discussion, they talk about what's important for the business right now. What do we need this month? What's happening with our team? What's happening with a new project? What output should we select to either add to your capabilities or improve to meet some standards? And that's an ongoing process that on then some periodic level can kick out information for promotion or transfer or, you know, exporting talent to another team and also for compensation reviews. So we're, we believe very strongly 
that you can build a truly agile talent development process as long as you're focused on accomplishments using the kind of framework that we offer. And you can measure it. You know, you can, it's a lot better than rating people on competencies. You know, you can identify, you can say how many action plans are being developed for people by their managers? You know, how many, how many improved work outputs are there here? You know, how, how about per manager? How much have you improved your people this quarter or this month or whatever it is? So these are some very straightforward, valuable things you can count. Uh, and, you know, there's some summary ideas here, which are, first of all, accomplishments link people directly to business results in a way that behavior doesn't. Uh, it's more simple and focused because there's fewer accomplishments and it's very much about the work at hand, if you will. Um, it's way less open to interpretation than things like rating people and competencies. Um, we can engage everybody in collaborating around this and we can focus on what matters. So we've got our coach manage lead family of programs and you can look at this quickly, but this is sort of the shameless commerce part. And we teach people our basic coaching methodology and then on the right, you'll see the modules we can add for leaders as they move up in terms of scope. Things like you can use this very same approach to execute strategic plans or to create employee engagement plans or to implement stuff or to manage processes. Um, and this is a long time colleague. This man was uh, my client at Dun & Bradstreet 25 years ago when we first were doing this work. And he, you can read this, but he says, you know, if I can't fit what I'm about to do as executive or manager in the six boxes model, then I don't do it. This model and the understanding I've gained about the factors that drive successful performance are central to my management leadership approach. Now, in full disclosure, John is now working with us in a kind of a semi-retirement uh, mode to introduce us to some of his fellow senior executives. But this is what he said quite a few years ago. Um, we certify people to deliver these programs. We got a whole bunch of free stuff. If you go to sixboxes.com, uh, white papers and articles, we don't require you give us your email, but we'd love to have you on our email list and you can contact me about this for anything you want. So I think that's with, with, within our time limit and I'm open to whatever comments or questions you guys might have. Any, uh, any takers? One question I had, Carl, as you were going through, and you talked about Amgen a while ago. You said yeah. they had 200 performance consultants. Yeah. Are they full-time performance consultants in oh, Amgen? Or oh, they? yes. Yeah, we started out probably eight years ago. And um, in, learning, in, in learning and performance in their operations organization, because they've got factories all over the world where they develop their, you know, they produce their biotech product, they're drugs essentially, but they're, they're pharmaceuticals based on living organisms. And so uh, we had a couple people there that were interested in our work. And I went in and I did an initial group of 10 or 12 people who were basically training and development folks who wanted to expand the scope and become performance consultants. They got very excited about the results that they saw. They had me come in a second time and then certify somebody internally to deliver that program. And he spent the next three or four years both developing additional performance consultants in different factories around the world and also, um, and also uh, kind of, you know, evangelizing this all. It was adopted as essentially a corporate standard. And now Gina, who is really in charge of this group, they've developed 200 people and they are full time in place, you know, embedded not only in operations now, but also in R&D and sales because they see the power of this thing and it's, it's their kind of way of driving continuous performance improvement. Okay. And then beyond them though, you are training managers and leaders and how to kind of do this. Yeah. We're not doing that there. Uh, it's very interesting because as you probably are aware, the people who do, who drive technical training and performance consulting are very often completely different decision makers than drive leadership and management development. So we've had a couple clients like Easter Seals Bay Area, which is a, you know, it's only got about a thousand employees, but they've adopted both programs. Uh, Change Healthcare is one of our more interesting ones. Um, they, well, the woman who I mentioned a while ago, BJ Vaughn, she brought us into Amera Group to develop a team of performance consultants because what she said is they already had really high quality training and development people. They wanted to expand their scope to be able to actually help solve performance problems, not just deliver training. So she viewed it there as a kind of a continuous improvement based on a really solid foundation. She then went to change healthcare 
And Change Healthcare is a high-tech growing organization. It's still pretty big, but it's, you know, it's moving fast and all that. And they didn't really have a strong management culture in place. So she brought in our coaching program, which now about, uh, I think they're, they're, a little, they're a bit under 1,000 people right now have gone through it. But um, they certified internal uh, facilitators and coaches. And so they're now driving it from kind of the bottom up. From, from, and they're creating a culture, really, that's pretty impressive. Um, so we've had both. You know, the idea is, the ideal, of course, is to have, performance professionals and leaders managers meet in the middle and collaborate. And that's happened to some degree, but we're still working on making that happen in a big way. Um, Cause they're different buyers, you know? Thanks. Any other questions or comments? I mean, does this make sense to people? Do you see the value of accomplishments, for example? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, what we find, you know, and it blew my mind 40 or whenever it was, 30 years ago when I clicked into this stuff, but it's, it really does. I've had groups where I introduce this stuff and it's almost like, you know, an evangelism experience where people say, oh my God, this changes everything. But when you, when you have a conversation with a direct report and you say, these are the things we expect you to contribute and these are, you know, and they're everything from documents and, you know, analyses, but also stuff like recommendations or um, relationships that meet certain criteria. And you, and you have a conversation about what a good one is. It is dramatic, first of all, how clear expectations can get. Way better than sort of, well, I want, to, I want you to exhibit strategic thinking, whatever that might look like. I'm going to rate you on a, you know, zero to five or something. Um, which is, by the way, a whole nother subtopic that I didn't want to get into today, but I've viewed competency models as problematic for years, but I've been fairly quiet about it. But I'm now seeing a lot of senior HR people saying, there's got to be something better than this. And we're pretty sure, based on our experience, that if you do your ongoing coaching and management, and if you do reviews based on accomplishments and how well you're doing on those, very concretely, that it's a lot better than giving, you know, a rating scale on competencies. Um, but anyway, I, I'm glad you, you see there's a difference because focusing on accomplishments changes a lot. It does. Carl, yeah, how do you bridge that gap with, with that conversation between competencies versus accomplishments and behaviors? Well, a couple things. First of all, I actually, I didn't emphasize it, but let me uh, show you a slide. Because uh, I always like to say we do have a place for competencies. Um, if you uh, just a second here, I gotta get, make my slide work properly here. But if you look, uh, if you look in the bottom row here, first of all, competencies are things that we attribute to individuals. If you look at the bottom row of the six boxes, you see the words in black: business acumen, trustworthiness, and career motivation. Those are all things from a standard core competencies list. And so we have a place for competencies in that we can put them in the six boxes. Now, my view is that they're too vague and abstract to be very useful, but uh, there's no, we don't have to have a fight here. You know, what we find is that in organizations that have adopted, for example, that are starting to build accomplishments into their job descriptions, they will have the standard job descriptions and it will list the competencies and the accountabilities and all that. And then at the end, it'll say, and these are the key accomplishments needed for this job. And so what I find is that although you might, most a lot of companies are so invested in performance management that is built around competencies, and we can't just you know, burn that down usually because there's a lot of resistance and investment involved, we can find a way to start focusing people on the valuable accomplishments that it doesn't bypass competencies, but it almost starts to make them irrelevant because you can get more precise. So it doesn't have to be a fight. It can just be an integration and then see what the value is. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I like that. I see the integration. You know, it, it, it almost looks like it's translating the, co the competency for that particular individual and how they exhibit that. Well, that's right. And you know, you've probably had this problem. I mean, I, I just get, gave a presentation in Seattle last week to a group of fairly senior L&D people and HR people. And I've been starting to ask this in groups and I've been saying, well, how's it going with those, you know, performance reviews and competencies? And I get a little bit of eye rolling and I say, and does the rating scale thing make people cynical? 
And people say, yeah, it really does. Cause it's like, did you have your Starbucks this morning as to whether I'm a four or a five? And they're kind of joking with that. But I think people feel very unsettled about the fact that much like what you just said, it's hard to nail down competencies. Uh, whereas if you start with the performance requirements, then it may be sensible to say, well, for this, to produce a good sales proposal, yeah, it would definitely need business acumen and, tr and et cetera, et cetera. You know, but I'd rather go from performance to competencies than trying to deduce performance from competencies. Yeah. Will. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Anything else? I know our time is probably up and I don't want to waste your time, but I can, I, I will send a, I'll upload this probably to our YouTube channel and I can send you a link if you want to share this with anybody. Excellent. And, and believe me, I really, I mean, I'd love to continue this conversation obviously, but, um, uh, in the sense that I think, you know, I, I don't know much about what you guys are doing for leadership and management. I know there's one big program, uh, Dan's just told me in general about it. I don't know the contents of it, but, uh, we always we always try to say, well, how about if you just do like a pilot with a small group and see how the coaching thing works? But I don't I'm not I don't I don't want to do that right now. But I'm just saying it'd be great if you look into it more deeply. I'd appreciate it. I, th I would just like to say, too, that I think this is great and so fascinating. I saw you speak at ATD and I went on the six boxes. It was so interesting. And then I got busy and I didn't. So uh, <laughs> I didn't do it anymore. So it's reminding me how interesting it is. And at this point, my lack of questions is just because there's so much of this and it's yeah. so interesting. I really want to know more. And I wouldn't even know where to start with questions. Well, a couple things. Not lack of interest. Yeah, fair enough. A couple things. Notice this is the white, our, our resource library at sixboxes.com has a bunch of white papers that are applications yeah. to specific stuff. And then also, please write down my phone number and an email address. I'm more than happy to address questions, you know, one-to-one -one or whatever. So, anyway, thank th you. thanks again for inviting me. Appreciate thank it. you so oh, much. Oh, thank you so much. So and so valuable. We, we thank you so much for your time this morning. You're most welcome.